Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you all so much for joining us today on today's webinar for Wealth Protection Strategies for Alberta Healthcare Professionals. We're certain to have uh, a very informa information packed session today, and I'm excited to introduce all of you to our two co presenters today Doran Mihalashi with MMCA and Associates. He is a partner of the firm, and he'll be discussing some of the recent tax changes in the province and specific strategies that all of you can take away and implement to limit your potential tax burden. And Trisha Decker, who is the Director of Business Development with ATB Financial, who will be discussing some of the unique financing options available specifically for healthcare professionals through ATB Financial. And to start off the presentation today will be Doran Mihalashi with MMCA and Associates. Doran, take it away. Hello everyone, uh, can you hear me? Hello? We can hear you, Doran. Brandon? We can hear you. Oh, okay. So I, ju I just wanted to get a confirmation. Uh, hello, everyone. So um, welcome to our joint presentation. And like uh, Brandon mentioned, uh, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to co-host uh, this, uh, this webinar together with Brandon and Trisha. Uh, the purpose of this, uh, of this presentation was not only to, de to deliver like a uh, generic information session as to what change and uh, kind of what are the exemptions and uh, uh, those are the new rules and we have to live with them, but also to take, a, take an integrative approach and see what we can do together as advisors to help our clients to preserve wealth. And um, to be more specific, I would like to, uh, I would like to start by uh, discussing about uh, what we see that it's still working and we we try not to overly complicate obviously there would be tax plans out there that uh, are going to create a uh, huge structures that uh, people can use for various purposes but we try to keep it simple i think simple it's it's better in some sense um and uh, i would like by starting just a short introduction because i need to address uh i need to address why we are doing this and uh, all it happened with the announcement in July 2017 uh, with the, what's known as tax on split income. And um, this, is, this is the government's take on what they perceived as being abusive in terms of paying dividends uh, to other family members without uh, much involvement into the business. Um, and without getting into the details, the, the only thing that I would take away out of the tax on split income would be um, this refers to income derived directly or indirectly from a related business, which in our case, because uh, we have only healthcare professionals, would be from the doctors or dentist business. So directly and or indirectly is pretty broad, uh, touches on every aspect of doing business with the, uh, with the spouse's corporation or business in general. And um, our approach is not to discuss really about tax on split income, but to discuss what, what else can be done. And uh, when I'm saying what else can be done is how we can increase some of the deductions and how we can ensure that the compensation can still be, sp be, be paid to the spouse of, or the common law. So achieving a, uh, achieving a uh, income splitting for that reason. Um, and uh, I just want to put a disclaimer as much as, uh, as I know what I'm talking about, but definitely uh, because TOSI is so new, uh, we don't have much jurisprudence. So law may change tomorrow, CRA can come up with some, something new that is going to completely shuffle the, the plans that we are talking about today. So uh, please always, when you are looking to implement something like this, you're, you are going to consult uh, professional advice. 
And um, I would like to get directly into what we are talking about. So everybody has a business, everybody has a potentially a clinic or is lo looking to open a clinic. And uh, at that point in time, we need to negotiate a lot of contracts. We need to purchase a lot of uh, capital assets. And uh, even for the existing clinics, uh, this, is a, this is a plan that may work uh, by uh, doing things a little bit different from what I'm going to discuss today. Um, but I would like to, to mention kind of the most important things that we've seen uh, with, with a clinic, whether it's, it's a medical professional or it's a, it's a dentist or it's a vet. So first of all, we need to ne negotiate the head lease with the landlord and we need to purchase equipment and or uh, provide for leaseholds for uh, uh, for the for the clinic for the interiors. Now, when the negotiation for the head lease is being done, usually that's being done directly between the professional corporation and uh, and the landlord. And same with the capital assets, with the purchases, the financing is being uh, negotiated with the bank. Uh, Trisha is going to talk more about that. Uh, in a minute here. However, what we are looking at is what if we can create a simple structure uh, where the real estate consultant, the accountant, the banker will come together uh, with, uh, with allow for some planning to be done and I'll talk in a second about, uh, about that structure. And uh, the structure is going to give us the opportunity to uh, transition some of the income that otherwise would be reported by the doctor. Uh, with transition to the to the spouse or the common law, and um, so the the structure that we are looking at, it's uh, oh, I guess I had the current status. So just just before we are getting into the current structure, I, I want to kind of uh, to show how what's the current status, what people are getting right now. So on a leasehold improvement, usually those agreements are uh, negotiated for five plus five year renewal term. So the leaseholds will depreciate straight line over 10 years. So pretty, pretty small deduction. Uh, equipment is getting depreciated at various rates, depending on the type of equipment. And if we do nothing and we try to pay a spouse out of the corporation, uh, under the new, Tossy rule dividends are pretty much out of discussion unless the spouse does certain things. So, and the salary is going to be subject to a reasonability test. So that's that's exactly where we are right now. Um, the government, in their wisdom, acknowledging that they uh, they put the brakes on many small businesses with the with the new rules is not only addressed to healthcare professionals. They have given they have given away. Uh, a little bit of incentive. So for any equipment purchase after November 2018, they are allowing the first year of depreciation to be multiplied by three. So let's say if under the general rules before you would have taken a depreciation for $100, in the first year now it's allowed $300. And um, that carries until 2024, starting 2024 uh, is going to be only two times the depreciation uh, otherwise uh, deductible and is going to finish the incentive in 2027. So that's just a side note uh, that the government is giving back something. And um, what we are going to do, so what we are looking at is to introduce a new investment company. And now the new investment company is going to negotiate the head lease and is going to negotiate the, the purchase uh, for the capital assets. And the, the investment company is going to turn around and is going to rent the space, including the capital assets and everything, uh, at a premium price to the, uh, to the clinic or to the, uh, to the spouse's business. And why we think this one is still works? Because first of all, the investment corporation is going to get into a long-term agreement with the landlord. And that's when the real estate, like Brandon, has to negotiate that agreement that allows for a subsequent sublease. Um, same with the capital assets. That's where Trish is gonna is gonna come uh, to help finance the purchase in a corporation, but assets being used in a 
in the professional corporation. But uh, the the, num the investment corporation is going to take the risk of being locked in into a long-term agreement and having all those purchases. However, when it's going to rent back to the uh, to the doctor's business, is going to be on a month-to-month. -month. So obviously, month-to-month -month more risk. So we create a risk element here, and we think a premium can be paid because of that risk element. The the incremental profits that we are going to obtain in the investment corporation will be distributed to the spouse and we think a safer way would be to distribute by way of salary not by way of dividends um, and we do have why we think this one is still works uh, for for a very good reason because with the tax on split income obviously they came up with some exemptions from the general rule where it says everything is being caught. So if it gets caught by Tossi rules, uh, the tax payable, it's pretty much the top marginal rate in the province. And uh, I'm going to use the one that really, that really matters in our case, just to keep it short here. And it's called excluded business. And excluded business pretty much makes a connection to to the spouse being actively actively engaged on a regular, continuous, and substantial ba uh, basis in the activities of the business. So as long as the spouse is the one that negotiates the contract, as long as the spouse is the one that uh, signs the sublease agreements, as long as the spouse is going to be the one that is going to uh, negotiate the capital asset purchases, definitely we can make the argument it's being engaged on a regular, continuous, and substantial in the business. Uh, the government put a um, bright threshold on what they see as being to meet the test, and they said 20 hours per week. However, the government always commented that they acknowledge there may be businesses that do not require, even if you are involved in the business, may not require 20 hours per week. Uh, and definitely with a rental business like a small office, uh, like spending 20 hours a week, like to do what? You collect the rents once a month. If there's nothing wrong with the assets, like what you're gonna spend the time on. So we, we still think we have an argument on meeting the test and meeting the exemption uh, to get us out of the tossy rules. So if that's the case, then any income paid into the investment corporation and paid to the spouse as a salary would not be caught by the by the new rules, and therefore at that point in time we achieved uh, we achieved our objectives. To start with, salaries should not be caught by TOSI anyways, just dividends and shareholder loans. But uh, there were comments again because this is new legislation without much jurisprudence. There were comments that. Uh, uh, CRA can uh, can go after some some other small rules just to make it uh, just to make it harder for business owner to split income with a uh, with a spouse. And um, again, this is just a just a short overview. But uh, the takeaway it is yes, can we create that secondary corporation where the spouse is actively involved into, and uh, they are going to take the risks at the beginning by entering in, into those high uh, long-term agreements and buying those capital assets yes if we could do that is the spouse entitled to uh, is a spouse entitled to uh, some benefits out of that corporation and we think yes that's the answer um, as i said uh, tossy not much jurisprudence i'm not aware of any court case that made it uh, to the courts yet even if they do start seeing some of those going uh, uh, going in front of the judge probably is not going to be until I would say at least 2022, 23 until we get some decisions on this because the process is very lengthy. Um, and uh, with that being said, I'm kind of going to the last to the last uh, point of my discussion. Um, so like I said, it's an integrative approach. It needs it needs a uh, a lot of moving parts to come together. That's why we need Brendan. That's why we need Trisha. That's why you need MMCA. Uh, one more thing that I'd like to mention is about a portfolio investment. Uh, there were comments at CRA where they, they were looking at and they said that the secondary 
that the income, second generation income, so income, portfolio investment income earned is, should not be subject to TOSI. And again, it goes back to the exemptions and whether or not we are into TOSI. But we think that if we do have a business where money is being lent by the professional corporation into, into this corporation, investment corporation, being held uh, by the spouse, and the spouse now with a minimum commitment is gonna have a, a financial advisor that is gonna invest the money and uh, generate income out of that portfolio and eventually paying dividends to the spouse just to recover the, the high tax on investment income. Potentially, that's another way out uh, out of the tossy will, and potentially that's another good way to to uh, split income with the spouses. Um, and uh, I think I'm just getting to to the end of my presentation here. Uh, again, please feel free to contact any of us to discuss. Again, this is just the tip of the iceberg. It's it's a lot to it's a lot to 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 the backgrounder and how it works and why it works and agreements, proper agreements needs to be put in place. Uh, please feel free to, to send me an email or a uh, phone, uh, take a picture in case you wanna have the contact information on the, um, uh, to have it available. And I think at the end of the, at the end of my part at least, uh, Brandon, I'm gonna turn over to you because we do have like, a, we do have some poll questions, I believe. Hello? Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, just on that one, we'd, we have a, uh, we have a uh, complimentary consultation that uh, we can offer to all our uh, of, uh, participants to the webinar. And also there is a book now, and again has been written with, uh, with the help of some other consultants. Um, can you bring that poll as well? Um, and um, hopefully this one is going to come out in uh, come out in March. Every time I'm saying that it's done, 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 CIA is coming up with another comment or another discussion on various topics. So I need to, to keep updating to the point that I need to pick up a cutoff date and say it's valid as up to this date. But um, this is going to be a very good uh, book for healthcare professionals for uh doctors dentists uh and it goes to the very basics of uh deductions tax plans and a little bit extra and i'll i'll let you read what that little bit extra it's about and if you like to be notified when the book is coming out please uh please select your answer in the uh please select your choice and uh we'll uh, we'll put you in our mailing list and uh now i'm gonna turn over to to Brandon to discuss about his part here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doran, for such a wonderful presentation. And as you mentioned, it really is the tip of the iceberg. That's you know one or two strategies that those in attendance are able to implement moving forward. But from my perspective, it's so important for healthcare professionals in Alberta to have a conversation. You know, based on their unique situation, there are strategies that I've seen you able to come up with that significantly mitigates the tax. Um, exposure in a lot of cases and given the changes that had occurred with CRA you know it's important that we are creative in coming up with some solutions that specifically benefit specific doctors so really appreciate that presentation Doran and I would encourage all of those in attendance to reach out and have a conversation with Doran in regard to you know your unique situation and really what's the best strategy moving forward from a tax perspective to limit that burden and are there areas that you're not taking advantage of 
For those of you who may not be as familiar with myself or Cirrus Consulting Group, my name is Brendan Madden. I'm a senior consultant and lecturer with uh, Cirrus Consulting Group. I've been with the firm now for just about three years and most recently I've taken over the management of our Canadian operations which means that on a daily basis, I strategize, I consult, and I advise doctors all across the country in different situations, right? Doctors looking to start a practice, open a new location, purchase a practice, uh, renovate, expand, and very importantly, those doctors looking to transition and ensure that the lease agreement is well-structured to support that endeavor. For those of you who may not be as familiar with Cirrus Consulting Group, we are a healthcare and dental specialized tenant representation firm. We were founded by doctors for doctors back in 1994, so we're celebrating our 25th year in business. And to date, we've negotiated over 10,000 dental and healthcare specific office lease agreements. We're very unique. We're really the only firm that does exactly what it is that we do in North America, whereby we've got an in-house leasing team comprised of former commercial real estate brokers and analysts. And that's the team that's able to provide us with market research across the country in terms of rental rates, property availabilities, landlord research, demographic information. We also in-house have a legal team comprised of real estate attorneys, all who have backgrounds in healthcare tenant representation. And finally, we've got our in-house consulting team, again, of which I'm one of our senior consultants. And this team strategizes, consults, and advise doctors all across North America in different situations to ensure that their lease agreements are properly structured to support their goals in the short and the long term. On an annual basis, we represent over a thousand healthcare professionals in the negotiation of their lease agreements. And we provide over a hundred continuing education courses on an annual basis, including seminars, webinars. And thankfully, we also have the opportunity to lecture at the majority of the major dental conventions on an annual basis, such as the Ontario Dental Association's annual spring meeting, the Pacific Dental Conference, which is coming up fairly quickly, um, and some of the conferences that are held in the United States as well. So clearly we have the opportunity to work with dentists and doctors and healthcare professionals nationwide. I thought it would be beneficial to provide you all with a little bit of a snapshot into some of the clients that we've worked with recently in and around the province for a couple of different reasons. First and foremost, this illustration shows the experience that we've had in Alberta with healthcare professionals in negotiating their lease agreements, whether it's starting a practice or renewing a lease. But also, it goes to show the issues that we'll be going through today, they don't only exist in certain parts of the country or certain parts of the province. Right? It's not only downtown Calgary that some of the items in the lease agreement, the issues in the lease agreement exist. Right, If you are a healthcare professional and you lease your space, it's absolutely imperative that you have the lease agreement reviewed by a healthcare specific consultant who has negotiated significant amounts of healthcare specific lease agreements because the nuance, the difference between all of your lease agreements and a typical or traditional retail establishment should be great. Now, what is a lease agreement? I'd like you all to think about the first word that comes to mind when you think about a lease agreement. I pose this question in front of the majority of the seminars that I conduct and I often hear the lease agreement is a contract. It's an agreement. It's a marriage between landlord and tenant. But one of the first things that most doctors, most healthcare professionals think about when they think about a lease is rent, right? It's the occupancy expenses. It's expensive. It's what I pay to the landlord on a monthly and annual basis. 
Now, why is it that when we think about a lease agreement, one of the first things that we think about is rent? Well, from my perspective, it does make sense. Apart from staff salaries and supplies, the occupancy expenses for your practices are typically one of the three larger expenses on your income statements. Right, so it makes sense that one of the first items we think about when we think about a lease is the rent. However, I would argue that the lease agreement is actually one of these. And not only is the lease agreement a check, I would argue to each and every one of you in attendance today that the lease agreement is one of the largest, if not the largest checks that you have ever signed or will ever sign in your entire lives. Again, I would argue to each and every one of you that the lease agreement is one of the largest, if not the largest checks that you will ever sign. Now, why do I say that? Well, on average in Alberta, we're seeing rental rates all in to lease space at approximately $40 per square foot. Now that is an all in rental rate, which means that is the base rental rate plus the triple net costs or the taxes, the maintenance and the insurance costs that the majority of you pay your proportionate share of. Most of you will have signed a triple net lease agreement. Again, and that means that you will pay a proportionate share, your proportionate share of the taxes, the maintenance and the insurance obligations that are incurred by the building on an annual basis as well as the base rental rate that you're paying under the lease agreement. Right, so all in, we're seeing rental rates in the province of Alberta at about $40 per square foot. And if we can agree, for example's sake, most doctors will start a $1,500 per square foot practice, that's about $60,000 in rent on an annual basis. Right, over a 10 year term, which the majority of you should and will sign for the initial term, that's a $600,000 expense that you've just signed on for. And if we can all agree, for example's sake, that on average, you'll spend about 30 years in private practice, that $600,000 over the initial 10 years becomes 1.2 million over the next 10 years, which becomes $1.8 million over a 30 year career. Now, for those of you who can raise your hands today, is there anybody in attendance who has rent that decreases on an annual basis? Right, typically that does not occur. So for example's sake, that $1.8 million could be closer to $3 million if we take into account rent escalations year over year. Right, so all of this is the reason that it's critical you don't solely focus on the rental rates when you're signing a lease agreement. If someone had put the lease agreement in perspective like I just have prior to you signing off on it, would you maybe have spent a few more minutes looking through the 40, 50, 60, 100 pages that follow the first two pages that discuss rent and term? So it's my goal today to encourage you all not to think about the lease agreement as rent and to ensure that you have well-structured legal terms and provisions, to ensure that you're not only focused on the rental rates, right? If we fight tooth and nail and get a $1 per square foot rent reduction, for a 1,500 square foot practice, that's $1,500 on an annual basis, when a lot of the legal terms and provisions, if not well-structured for a healthcare practice, can cause significant issues and hundreds of thousand dollars over the course of your career. So why is the lease so important? Well, first and foremost, the practice location is the foundation of the practice, right? No location, we cannot see patients. If we can't see patients, we cannot produce healthcare. If we cannot produce healthcare, we cannot earn a living. If your lease agreement is not well-structured, your security in the space is not certain, period. Secondly, we make a significant investment into the practice, into the space that we lease when we start our clinics. Right on average, we're seeing healthcare practices spend approximately $150 to $200 per square foot 
to build out the clinic. Right, so if we're making a $200 per square foot investment just to build out the space, the plumbing, the electrical, the demising walls, the light fixtures, what have you, $200 per square foot at 1,500 square feet in a 1,500 square foot space, that's $300,000. And that does not include equipment. Right, so we're looking at anywhere from $500,000 to a million dollars just to build a 1,500 square foot practice. It's for that reason that each and every one of you should have a better lease agreement than your neighbors and any other retail establishment in your building and in the area, period. Along the same lines, it's very difficult and very time consuming to relocate a practice, right? Apart from a tuck-in acquisition, is there anyone in attendance today who purchased or started their clinic in the location that they're in with the intention to relocate it? Most of you don't. Most of you plan to stay there for the long term and if your lease is not properly structured from a legal perspective, you may be forced out of the space sooner than you had ever expected. Some of you will have relocation clauses in your leases, some demolition provisions, which allow the landlord to terminate your lease upon 30, 60, 90 days notice in a lot of cases. Now imagine for a dental practice, for example, being forced to relocate in 30 days, it's impossible. And finally, the lease agreement has a significant impact on your ability to sell the practice if you choose to do so. So what should the lease do for you? Well, it should absolutely provide you with fair and affordable financial terms, but that doesn't only mean the base rental rate, right? We should be getting tenant improvement allowances when we're starting a practice, free rent periods, fixturing periods. How is the additional rent article structured in our lease agreement? Are we receiving detailed and itemized statements from the landlord that show us exactly what we're paying for those additional rent expenses, the taxes, the maintenance, and the insurance? Or are they just summary reconciliation statements that give us no transparency into exactly what we're paying for? You should all know exactly what you're paying for snow removal, for landscaping, for janitorial and repairs to the building. Right, not just what you're paying all in for maintenance on an annual basis. The lease should also provide us with long-term stability and security. The majority of you should be looking to obtain 10-year lease terms with two or three five-year options to renew the lease agreement. The lease should minimize any risk and exposure Right, unfortunately, from my experience, the majority of you joining us today will have provided unconditional, irrevocable, absolute, and continuing personal guarantees. That is unreasonable. I'm not so concerned when we're starting our first clinic because typically we've got some debt and we have not started to grow our asset base and net worth. But as we progress through our career, it is unreasonable to provide unconditional, irrevocable, continuing and absolute personal guarantees, especially spousal guarantees. We should be looking to limit any personal exposure we have under the lease agreement. Most of you should have an incorporated entity. That should be the tenant on the lease. It should not be you personally. And moving forward, it's absolutely critical we start to limit any personal guarantee or indemnification we've provided to the landlord. The lease should maximize your flexibility, right? You got into private practice for a reason and that's to run the business the way that you see fit. So in the event you choose to go on vacation, will the landlord allow you to close the practice for a week or two? Or in the lease agreement, are, is there language surrounding business hours? and a continuous occupancy. The lease agreement should also provide you with flexibility in the form of a room to expand, for example, right? If we hit capacity in the space, do we have a right of first refusal option in the lease agreement that would allow us to expand into the adjacent space should it become available? Do we have any right of first purchase options? that would allow us to buy the building that we are in, in the event a bona fide offer is submitted to the landlord, 
or in the event our unit is condominiumized, do we have the first right to buy that condo unit? God forbid anything ever were to happen to any of you joining us today and you were no longer able to practice. Is there a death and disability provision included in your lease agreement that would allow you to terminate the lease or sell the clinic? Right, and if we're able to obtain all of these items, we can ensure that the lease agreement enhances our ability to sell the practice and acts as an asset as opposed to a liability. So what's in your lease agreements? In front, you'll see an illustration of a lot of common lease terms, all which have significant importance on your practices. I would encourage you all to look through your lease agreements and analyze these articles to ensure that they're well structured. And if you see any potential red flags or language that needs clarification, take proactive action to make those changes sooner rather than later. The assignment and subletting provision in most of your lease agreements is found verbatim the way that you'll see in the illustration in front of you. And there's a few red flags that are inherent in this assignment article. First and foremost, in order to assign the lease agreement and transfer the lease in connection with a sale of the practice, we would need the consent of the landlord and it does not show us how we go about getting that consent. Next, just for requesting the consent of the landlord to transfer the lease in connection with a sale of the clinic, the landlord is given three options, to approve the transfer, decline the transfer, or terminate the lease. Again, this is found in 75% of the leases that we review. If the landlord decides to terminate the lease agreement at the 11th hour of a practice sale, what would you do? It then goes on to state that if the landlord agrees to allow you to transfer the lease, they can have the buyer of the practice pay a 15% rent increase. This next section goes on to state that should the assignee or the vendor or the seller of the practice receive any consideration, period, in connection with the transfer of the lease agreement, 100% of that consideration shall be paid to the landlord directly within 30 days of the tenant's receipt. This again is found in 75% of the leases we review and this is giving the landlord the ability to take our sale proceeds. It's absolutely critical that you're looking through the assignment article and ensuring there's no language similar to this type of language in your lease agreement. It finally goes on in this article to state that even if you get the consent of the landlord to transfer the lease and sell the practice, you will remain on as a guarantor for the buyer of your clinic. That is unreasonable. The landlord has the ability to vet the buyer. You should be released of ongoing liability as soon as you sell the practice and transfer the lease agreement. So I encourage you all to go through this assignment article in your leases. The cost of this mistake could be significant, right? The inability to sell the practice, having to absorb a significant rent increase, staying on as a guarantor post sale, and paying the landlord a percentage of the sale proceeds that you've worked your entire career to create, right? There are a number of other traps in the office lease agreement that you should be aware of, and I would encourage you to go through your leases with a highlighter and make note of any potential red flags, anything you don't understand, and take proactive steps to amend those items. One of the items that we offer at Cirrus Consulting Group is a, called a critical dates and risk analysis. We spend three to four hours with our legal team reviewing the lease agreement for any potential red flags and then jump on a phone call with you to walk you through any red flags we came across, go through the ideal vision, the goals that you have for the practice, and what do we need to do to the lease agreement in order to ensure that it supports those goals over the short term, the long term, and very importantly, through a transition of the practice. 
We also offer our professional lease negotiation service, which is a $9,995 service, which includes the critical dates and risk analysis. Every part of the negotiation would be handled for you. We're giving you your time back, right? 50 plus hours is what we spend on average in a renewal and a startup negotiation which at $400 an hour of your time, and for some of you it will be more, that's a $20,000 savings of your time that we're creating. The lease agreement increases the practice value immediately upon amending those critical items. And we give you peace of mind, right? We reduce the risk to you and your family, both personally and professionally and ensure that the lease is properly structured so that no issues will arise over the course of your career. For those of you in attendance today, I'm happy to provide a complimentary critical dates and risk analysis or lease review consultation. Again, it's valued at $1,495, but for those of you in attendance today, it is a complimentary service. So feel free to take my contact information we will have a poll toward the end of the session today, but we've had some technical issues with the polling questions, so feel free to take my contact information if you would like a complimentary review of your lease agreement, or if you're looking to start a practice and you would like some guidance on the best approach to ensuring you get the right space and the right lease in place, feel free to let me know. For those of you, again, in attendance today, it will be complimentary. For time's sake, I'm going to pass it on to Trisha Decker, again, Director of Business Development with ATB Financial for her part of today's presentation. Thank you all. Thank you, Brendan. Um, I am, like Brendan said, the Director for Business Development for ATB. ATB is a bank. Uh, it is owned by the Alberta government, so it's unique from the other banks. Uh, there are a few features that make us a little bit unique, one of them being that the de full deposits that are in bank accounts are entirely guaranteed by the government. So typically that would be $100,000 would be what most financial institutions have, um, and that that's covered by an insurance that they have in place. For, for ATB, we cover the full amount. We are Alberta-based, so we only uh, we work for Albertans, by Albertans, uh, the clinics that we finance are all from Alberta. Um, and although ATB is unique in the healthcare space, or not unique, it is new in the healthcare space, I have been working with healthcare professionals for close to 15 years for the financing of their clinics, uh, primarily in Alberta, but also in BC. Uh, so we'll just go through how we can help. Engage your banker at any point in time when you're wondering about when when to engage us. Um, you can we can help by partial ownership purchases. So if you're looking to just purchase a share in a clinic, uh, you're looking to purchase 50%, 20%, whichever. We can help with that. We can help with buying a practice at the asset or share sale. We can also help with the build out and equipment financing for startup practices. And also if there's any improvements, replacement that you want to do on an existing practice. There are other items as well that I didn't include in this presentation due to time sensitivity, but some of them would be owning a building, construction of a, of a building for your clinic. Those would be additional items that we would be able to look at. This is probably the most important slide out of all of my, all of my slides that I'll be presenting. And it's important points you should consider when you're looking at, at purchasing or starting up a clinic. Engage your advisors, advisors early. So make sure that you have your Brendans, your Dorans, um, a lawyer as well, who we don't have kind of included into this call, but make sure that you've engaged everybody and that we all know each other. It's so important to, for everybody to have a good understanding of what we can do for each other, how we can help each other, and also know your market space. As, as Brendan was mentioning, you know, it's important to have somebody who does dental or medical, um, just because we know those spaces. That's where we work every day. We're, there's nothing that's going to kind of pop out that we haven't seen before. So that's one of the most important things. We rely on 
on lease negotiators or lease consultants to look at those practice relocation clauses to make sure that we have demolition provisions that are mitigated uh, to negotiate the, the lease and determine those costs. We also want to make sure, like he had also indicated, that 10 years are on that term. You'll see as we go through sort of what my offering is that the term loans for clinic purchases and startups are over 10 years, but that's reliant on that lease as well. So the reason why I'm coming in last on this presentation is because a lot of what I need is actually also reliant on Brendan and Doran. Um, you, the bank really needs them to have their opinions in. Uh, the other thing, so we, and I rely on Doran to determine that structure. So if we are going to use a holding company to hold the lease and then also be able to fund, or that's where we put leasehold improvements through or anything along that, those lines to help with your income splitting, as well as to help with another thing, which is GST, um, we need, Doran kind of structures it and then we, we structure our financing that way. He also provides projections in particular for startup clinic, because we really want to look at what three years looks like. Um, making sure that that you can make your payments and he also will determine if we should look at leasing equipment or financing equipment so what does our structure look like so it's really important for all of the advisors to be engaged early um, and then we can all talk to each other the other thing that we like is the business plan and budget or that's an important thing to consider we want you to look at what you want to do with your business how you plan on making on making your projections happen, how, what you plan on doing, you need to provide to us an, a really good overview of what that's going to look like. Um, we're going to, what you should also do is engage a diverse range of vendors for quotes. So you might talk to a few of the suppliers and see, you know, what, what quotes they are, who, what everybody is suggesting that you're going to be paying um, for equipment, for your build out of your clinic. Those are primarily your two um, biggest costs associated with the clinics. Again, determining your structure. Uh, if we have a holding company or an operating company, <laughs> typically that company is going to have a GST number. Underneath your professional corporation, most often times you will not have a GST number. So a GST is a true cost associated with the build out. We will finance that cost, um, but it's also, it, it's important to, to be able to get it back if that's possible. And that's what Doran would assist with. So that is that slide. Trisha, the other tr yeah? Trisha, sorry, can I just make a comment? Like with or without that holding company on the side, the GST, it's a true cost. We, we cannot get away without paying the GST on, on building the so clinic. So that's- You do, you pay the, the GST, but it's a determination of being able to get the GST back. So in any case, right. there, it's an important piece of, of, it's important to review with your accountant who will then talk to your banker. Um, the financing okay. options that you have are building a startup, renovating an equipment financing, and then buying a building for your practice. These can happen at any time throughout their opportunity. Um, you can potentially buy a building once your clinic is up and operational and move the clinic over. But again, those are all things that have to be determined when you're looking at purchasing a clinic or looking at, at yeah, purchasing the clinic, exactly what you're paying for the leaseholds, what it's going to be doing to move your building over, move your practice over to your own building. So at any point, any of these opportunities can arise and it's important to plan early and engage again the team of advisors. So we just want to know what you're up to. So these, this, this slide is pretty busy. The next few slides are going to be fairly busy. They're talking about what we can do. So if you are looking at building a startup practice, all of the banks are fairly similar. We're all going to be offering 100% financing of the budgeted costs. We want to make sure that those budgets are met. Um, if there are any cost overruns, typically the banks are not financing those. So if you have a million dollar budget, stick to your budget. We will pay for the GST associated with any of the with any of the build out costs. We will amortize those loans over 10 years. Typically, you're going to have two years of interest only on a startup. A startup takes a lot longer to build out cash flow. You don't start with a patient base. You don't start with money coming in the door right away. So we do allow you two years for interest only. And everything will be at prime plus zero. So prime currently is 3.95. Uh, there are also 100% financing equipment costs. Again, includes GST and it's under the same parameters of, of the building out of your space. There is a bunch of information that we need. Ultimately, I would just advise on the information to, to contact your banker and ask. We can give you this list, um, this list like that's outlined here. 
and provide you also the financial, personal financial statement that we want. But we also want to see your resume and your or your your CV. Basically, we want to finance people who are who have experience in dentistry. So are typically, it's about two years out of school at least. Ultimately. Um, that would be, there are situations where, where it arises where you might not be out of school for two years and that's fine. Um, but again, that's kind of just our general guideline. And again, this is more information that's required. Some of the things that we do require, um, this is prior to funding, but after, or before funding, but after the actual application. So certain things that we need and that you'll, you should start thinking about when you do look at the potential of buying your clinic or starting it up. One of the things that we need is assignment of life insurance to cover the full amount that's being, that's being requested. So oftentimes, of course, um, it's cheaper to get your insurance when you're younger or when you kind of come out of school, you have a general idea of what what it is we have term or there is term life insurance we have what we call business loan insurance which is good for in a pinch um, it it maxes out at about two million dollars but it is more expensive than the term policies so ultimately I tell everybody to contact your insurance providers and review that in particular we also want confirmation of disability insurance and again that would be covered with your insurance advisor other additional items are triple guard insurance um, and then we also need the, the invoices. So what we do with a startup clinic is that you essentially are approved for a million dollars and you provide us the invoices. We would then pay your suppliers or your contractors directly for you to ensure that those are being, are being paid. And then once the clinic actually opens up, we would also activate what we call an operating line or it acts as an overdraft for you, which would go with the day-to-day -day banking, uh, which would go with your day-to-day -day bank account and act as an overdraft. So as you need the money to pay salaries or pay rent or whichever, then um, that kicks in. One thing also with this part or with any lease negotiations is that for a startup in particular, the banks will pay for everything that you have to pay um, for the build out of that space. Now, if you're in your lease, if you negotiate a tenant allowance, we will want, which basically means that your that your landlord will give you some money back according to your square footage or however that's negotiated. Um, when that happens, the banks will request that money be paid back onto the loan because we funded those those leasehold improvements or the the renovations to the space, and then we want that money back because ultimately the landlord is then paying you for some of the fixtures that have gone into their space. Now. If during your lease negotiations, you negotiate a rental free period or a long rental free period, rent free period, then we don't require that amount back. So that's something to consider when you're negotiating those leases as well is that it, I would say, in particular for the startups, that, well, startup I think might be the only one, but in any case, um, I would say that a, a longer rent free period is better for you than a TI allowance, strictly on my side of things for the financing side, because you do not have to pay that back to the bank. So the, we also want the lease to be 10 years. Our term loans are over 10 years, so we want to ensure that you have the space for that long. Renovation and equipment financing is similar, um, similar to the startups. Again, we'll finance 100%. In this case, we only do one year of interest only. Basically, you have a clinic already, you have the cash flow already to support these loans. So we give you one year to kind of get that cash flow back up and running and, and you know, just iron out any of the kinks. But this one is one year, whereas the, the other one was two years. And basically for financing on this side of things, we want the actual financial statements of the clinic. So on the startup, we require projections from your accountant, from Doran. Um, and in this case, we, we look at the actual financial statements, what's called the notice to reader typically that Doran or your accountant would provide. Again, this is the same information as to what we would need, all the insurances, all that kind of stuff. And then these are the other options that we have that, that the banks would have. You have your online banking. So with your online banking, you can actually typically, you can typically add on different individuals. So whether it be your accountant or an office manager to have separate sign-ons so that your liability or that your, your it's really to prevent fraud um, so that you can see exactly who's going on, what they're doing. You do not want to give anybody your online banking password because then they have full access to everything into your account. So it's important to get what we call the enhanced online banking or ATB online. 
And that would be able to, at that point, you'd be able to see what other people are doing or grant them access to view and not, not make payments or to make payments up to a certain dollar figure. So there's lots of options that you have with that online banking. There's also deposit growths. You can look at, with our deposit specialists, you can look at different GIC laddering savings accounts, just making sure that your money is making money and that it's tax effective. So again, I'd consult with Doran to make sure that we have it in the right way. The other things are your point of sale. So ATB partners with Moneris, but you could have a Chase Payment Tech or um, lots of different options. Basically, you can always ask for those to get to, to be reviewed annually by your contact as well, or whoever you're dealing with right now. Those can add up to substantial costs for you. So I would say with the point of sale with ATB, we actually do all the back end processing. So our, our, our fees I have seen have been historically a lot lower, but that would be something that you should absolutely check into for cost savings. Uh, insurance support, we do have, like I mentioned, the, the loan insurance. However, it would not be my first suggestion to you. And then there's also payroll services. So we work with Ceridian. Um, and of course, there's ADP and other options for you. And then there's the wealth management. So we have a different arm at ATB Wealth that would be able to work alongside myself. Um, I'm on the business side of things, but we'd have the wealth management who would be able to look at, at planning and the personal side. And those would be all of the options on my side. So I... Oh, and then timeline, the last, the last one, of course. Timeline, often people aren't sure how long these sort of things last or how long it can take. Basically, from start to finish, if you have an, a clinic that you're looking at buying or renovations that need to be done, the quickest we can do it is approximately three weeks. It takes one to two weeks to get the approval, gather the information, get the approval. Um, when you're looking at a startup clinic, it can take a lot longer even than six months. I've worked with people who have taken years while they're negotiating their leases and looking at the space that they want and making sure that everything is available. You don't want to get in a space just because you can. You want to make sure that the terms are, are the right ones for you. And then you engage your bank and your financing approval. So typical approval is about two weeks. Um, if there's any back and forth or questions, of course, that can, can go on to that four week period. And then basically fulfilling and signing your, signing your application or signing your documents. We use external lawyers to have you, once we sign the commitment letter, then you go to a lawyer to get all the, the collateral document signed so that you know exactly what you're signing. Um, so from start to finish, quickest that can be done is about three weeks and on average it's probably closer to two months, especially with the insurance side of things. So it's just really important, like I mentioned earlier, to engage your advisors early so that everybody knows, knows what you're thinking, how to proceed, and can work with you on your timelines. So that is uh that's out on my presentation if you do have any questions i'd be happy to discuss with you and there's my contact info um so if you want to jot it down or i believe i know we have the polls and i know brendan was mentioning there's some issues with it so um, i'm always available at that email and phone number and i'd love to hear from you brendan Thank you so much, Tricia, for a wonderful presentation. I think one of my main takeaways is, you know, let those advisors do what they do best and ensure that, you know, you're structuring and um, getting together a really trusted team that, you know, you've got professionals who you trust and who are going to support you um, and ensure that your best interests are taken care of. So thank you both for wonderful presentations today. Um, I do want to pull up the polling questions.